I have some bad news. Some sad news. Some sadness just washing over you. So if you're a Norwich fan, you're a Watford fan, maybe this isn't the video for you. The training guide ends with this video. This is the summation of a lot of work, but it is over. Once you finish, mean, it's not over yet though. You gotta finish the video first, so. The complete guide to training in football managers, a very big worldly sounding phrase. We've been attacking different pieces of training throughout the last month in an entire series. Those videos will be linked throughout this video, but we will be tying them all together and giving you those few tips at the end to make sure that you can react to every situation and train your team the best possible while staying fit and developing players and winning games. Capisce? Capisce? <laughs> And we go chronologically in the course of a season, starting with your staff. We have shown in this video that coaches are important for the development of players, that physios and sports scientists are effective and important. The better that they are, the less you're going to get hurt and the shorter those injuries are going to be. So if you're at a new club and you haven't set your staff yet, that is the number one thing you need to do as you are beginning a new season, is make sure you get the best possible staff in you make sure that in your training coaches, edit coach assignments, you have a low workload and a high star rating on all of these different sections, which includes having one coach that's great at everything. If you don't know, you just hover over it. It tells you what they need. One coach that's great at everything and a few other coaches that are able to come in and, you know, well, we just need to, let's just say we need a little help. We need a little help right here. And we're just gonna reduce the workload right there of technical by adding somebody else there. It's easy. Getting a good staff in now is just gonna make your team better in the long run. As you get your staff in place, now it's time to start the preseason. We released an entire preseason training schedule, and that is described in this video. It's also linked down in the description if you would like access to it. And it looks like this. But the reason to do this, and the reason specifically for so much endurance training, is to prepare your team for the rigors of the season. If you are able to institute this preseason training, your team will not only be able to follow the training that we have scheduled for the rest of the year, it will also get less fatigued over the course of the season. But there are a few particular things you need to do while you are instituting this preseason training. One, when you go into coaches and edit assignments, you will notice that the coach workload in your fitness section is going to be much higher while running this preseason training. That is to be expected, so make sure that you defer one or two extra coaches over there to make sure that it's at least at average, and if you can get it down to light, get your fitness training down to light for the preseason, because as you can see, the majority of the training you will be doing will be physical in the preseason. This also presents you with an opportunity and a concern. At the beginning of the preseason, you will do one thing for the first of two times. At the beginning of the preseason, you will go through as the first week of preseason training is happening and make sure that everybody's workload at the bottom and individual workload is no higher than medium. This should not go higher than medium at any point. And because you're having more intense training in the preseason, that means more often on particular players, you're not gonna wanna be training player traits or developing their weaker foot or doing anything for additional focus on players because that can add to the individual training workload, which we don't want to go over medium because then we are really running an injury risk. If you can't see this stuff, you go to staff responsibilities here, staff, staff responsibilities, go to training and make sure you are controlling training. You want to lead training if you are going to fully institute this for every single team at your club. That is something that you want to take control of now. We will discuss what you do with the youth teams later, but in the preseason, it is the same for everybody. Now, if this doesn't push a player over medium training workload, developing physical attributes will work better in the preseason. Something like quickness, strength, agility, balance, endurance, those sorts of things will improve faster in the preseason because you are emphasizing it so much in training already. So just something to add if you feel like you can add it in the individual training workload. But what about players like Christian Kuba? He's on training workload light. Why is that going on? His intensity level is at half, but that little circle right here means that his intensity level is on automatic, which you want every single one of your players to have the intensity level on automatic is one of the basic tenets of this training is that if you go to your training rest section it looks like this this needs to be set up at the beginning of the season and needs to stay we'll tell you 
why in excruciating detail in a bit. Another key decision that you have to make in the preseason is where your players are going to be. So most clubs, you're going to have a youth team. For me, it's a U18s team. You're going to have a senior team and you might have a reserve team. If you take control of their training, they'll pop out on the left on this little sidebar. Now you want to decide who is going to be on which team. There is a development section to this video that is going to be later. But what I want you to think about is that if a player is on the first team and they are not playing and you play them in your youth matches, you have that little message that comes up that's like, gee, I think I'm going to make available for U18s. They're not training two days a week instead of one day a week because they also don't train when your senior team is not playing or is is playing when your senior team is playing they're not on the field they're not training they also play a match on a different day they're not training this means 38 days out of the year in a normal league schedule at least that player is missing a day of training that's over a month of training days that that player will miss so do not have a youth player in your first team especially if they're under 18 unless they're going to play in matches and you're not going to play them in the u18 matches or u20 matches or reserve matches all the time because then they are just quite literally missing over a month of training you usually will play over 40 games in the season they miss training every single one of those days and especially if they're not on the field so the generally approved way and the way we tested all of this stuff is with a squad of 25 players full setup of starters full setup of backups and a couple of swing players at the backside if they don't fit into those 25 you want to put them into the youth teams and if you absolutely need to bring them up them bring them up more on that later of course but the last important bit on preseason if you don't have the opportunity to institute this intense preseason schedule don't institute the full training regime that we have developed for the rest of the season because your team is not going to be prepared to handle it you are going to see an increase in injuries on your team based off what you would see in training if you had done this preseason to prepare your team for that level of intensity you can institute certain pieces like say we want you know we want, we'll grab some match boosts we'll grab some youth training but you can't institute the entire thing unless you've done this preseason to prepare one match a week you play your starters 45 minutes, you play your backups, your second 11 for the next 45 minutes. And if you do that for five, six weeks, you're gonna have full match sharpness on everybody in a team that is absolutely rip roaring to go for the season. Which brings us into the actual season where we have made a video about match boosts, which is right here, which are those little things that can make you better in the next match, which is not only important for obviously winning matches, which is the entire point of the game. It also allows you to get better match ratings, which aid development. So they are still a development tool. So it's not like you're wasting time developing players. Our basic one match per season training regime looks like this. Very important thing for you to do throughout the course of the season is rotate your individual attacking training rotate your individual defending training through engaged disengaged and wide ground and aerial defense don't focus on nearly as many attributes or important attributes and in attacking you want to stay with attacking wings or attacking direct that will also focus on the broadest range of attributes but patient is actually fantastic when you look at what it works on a lot of mental attributes that really just help you build play and it's great you can also rotate your technical training through different aspects of the game but making sure you rotate these two is important as the basic is defending from the front, which while it really does a good job of improving your attributes, especially when it comes to your forwards, you can see its primary focus is on the attacking unit. So your defensive unit over time will start to complain. We'd like to avoid that. You also want to provide a focus on your defensive unit over the course of the season. Remember that overall training in particular and outfield as well are very, very intense versions of training. So if you have some sort of unorthodox schedule that our basic one match or two match training regime does not prepare you for, be sure not to include overalls and outfields in there because that is a very intense version of training where you look at the intensity of a training day like this, where we have attacking patient defending from the front, the intensity is quite low. And do not be afraid of taking the training regimes we have and say you need more team cohesion Cohesion, you can swap this out for, let's say, a match review, which is going to aid your team cohesion. It's also going to be just a little bit less intensive. And then swapping this to a defending disengage. And then you've got a nice distribution of one attacking training a week, one defending training a week, and getting your match boosts in here with defensive shape, attacking movement, and teamwork. Now that you understand the theory behind it, you can take those steps to tailor this training specifically to make your team better throughout the season.
season. But also avoid this over the course of most of the season, unless basically your entire squad is tired because recovery actually lowers match sharpness more aggressively, which can make your team rather strangely more prone to injury. So recovery is detrimental to people who are not tired, which is why we've gone into this rest and we've said lower intensity, right? Half intensity for people that are really tired, normal intensity for players that are tired and double intensity for players that are completely fit because we're not able to sell half the team to go to recovery and tell the other half of the team to go to training. So this is the best that we can do. Because while you're in the middle of the season, your greatest concern is going to be injuries. So that's what we're going to talk about now. The war against injuries is always a balance between having fatigue that is too high and match sharpness that is too low. Now, match sharpness is always completely visible. This is your match sharpness right here. It's this little thumbs up, arrow going up, arrow going down. You want it to be thumbs up as much as possible. If it's not, your player is more prone to injury and that is it. While fatigue is a little less obvious. Now this heart, rather annoyingly, actually has different shades of green. You can see a player like Baran or Novais has a nice bright green, while this has got a bit of a tinted green. You might notice during matches that players are getting more tired, or you're somebody that pays a lot of attention, so you go to the medical center and you sort by fatigue, and you find that there are certain players that have at least a low level of fatigue that you might want to manage. Fatigue is less obvious than match sharpness, but the higher your fatigue gets, not only will they get tired faster, the more likely they are to get hurt, and those things feed into each other. So recovery is important because it reduces fatigue, but here you see it also reduces sharpness, so you don't want to do too much recovery. When you're using the rest screen, you are finding the balance between creating less fatigue and more match sharpness, which is why after the first match, it is actually okay to go one recovery and then do two things of training, because this will help your players get better, stay fit, and not put players that didn't play through multiple recoveries. This is assuming that everybody has played over these two matches, and then you throw in a double recovery at the end. Another thing that is proven to reduce injuries in Football Manager is clicking the subscribe button on this channel. That is a scientific fact. On the other hand, the like button is proven to reduce fatigue. So it's really a perfect combination just below the video. Last bit for your basic training throughout the season is that you can concentrate match boosts for important matches. Let's say this match is a cup final. Well, I'm actually going to replace and say, well, let's just not do defending training this week. That is more of a long-term thing. Let's work on some more of our set piece stuff. Let's work on the fact that maybe we're going to be in a penalty shootout. Let's add set pieces and work on defending our free kicks instead of doing a little possession training. These add actual boosts the same way that the different match boosts, like attacking movement, defensive shape, teamwork, the, the same way those work, these will add boosts for your upcoming match and defending free kicks, attacking corners, penalties, delivery, whatever. And you can stack those up before a very important match to get every boost possible if you want to sacrifice your training for a week. But specifically on injuries, there are two staff members that deal with this. We have physios and we have sports scientists. And we did a whole video looking at the ways that these two actually interact with the game. You can look at our tables of data in that video if you want. Sports scientists reduce fatigue. Physios work with players through injuries and provide you with a more accurate prediction of how long the injury will be the better they are. That's what those two roles serve. And that's how they help you combat injuries in different ways. One's preventative on fatigue and then one is there to get the player back faster and tell you when they're coming back. But now to development. Developing Wonder Kids is just like the core of football manager. There is no better feeling than signing a 17 year old than they become messy and you get to take all the credit because you are the only person in your FM universe. I'm very sorry to burst that bubble. You're actually not though, because if you want to watch me play FM and follow along with the journey of our team from the Austrian second division that just beat Bayern Munich after seven years, then I do stream on Twitch five days a week. The link is down in the description. We have a wonderful time, sometimes a little too wonderful. Oh, the team's been pretty good this year. Honestly, I've been enjoying it. <laughs> and there's no pressure to watch there because we do have a live YouTube channel where you can keep up with the entire save like it's episodes on YouTube. They're edited down, condensed versions of the stream as well as the full streams. You want to throw that stuff on while you work. All that down in the description and more. But development's the most recent video we released is the training series. That video is right there if you want to dig into it more. The development of players is very complicated. It's very opaque in Football Manager, but... These are the basic principles. A player that is 18 years old or over is going to be more reliant on game time to develop, while a player that is younger than 18 years of age is going to be more reliant 
on training. The trick is what this means. How long does a player have to play in a match? Good question. 15 minutes. This means you should sub them in before the 75th minute because you got a couple minutes of stoppage time and a couple minutes before that sub can be made. Maybe 73rd just to be safe. This 15 minutes gives them a match rating. This then counts for the development. And we do have complete training regimes for your youth and your development. We actually have two different ones though. First, we have the under 18 player training regime. This is not focused on winning the matches at all. And because match ratings and playing in matches aren't nearly as important at this age, it is all about getting as much development in there as possible. You want to make sure your days are themed. We've got our defending day, our attacking day, our technical day. We've got our physical day with a recovery at the end to make sure that the fatigue does not increase too much. And we even throw in a little bit of goalkeeper training. We have no match boosts. We have no team cohesion building. This is all about giving your players opportunities to focus on their training. And you can, of course, rotate these individual pieces, although I wouldn't recommend it on defense as much because this is focusing on two separate sets of attributes entirely and is very helpful. But in terms of rotating your physical training, there is nothing necessarily wrong with moving to working on their strength for a little bit, even though quickness is just so freaking important. And that physical at the beginning is going to work on everything. So I promise this is the most balanced, but you you know your team best and if you need to focus on something else. Now, if you're developing your training for players that are 18 years and older, this is a U23s team, a reserve team, a B team, whatever it happens to be, you want them to play in the highest league possible. So you are going to want to switch it around a little bit. We've got a boost spot here with delivery, a boost spot here with team bonding and teamwork. You can, of course, rotate this stuff in and out with attacking movement, with defensive positioning, but you also want to make sure that you are still training well because training is still obviously important. It is just not the end all be all because matches are also important for these players. What you want is for those players to win matches and for that team to get into the highest league it can possibly get into, which will then in turn allow you to use that team more for player development. But of course, on top of that, there is what we call the Wonder Kid Blaster, where if you've got one or a couple of good Wonder Kids that are in the same part of the field, you can quite literally focus your training on developing those players and just say, screw it to all those defenders that have one star potential. Like this freaking dude, I do not want to waste training developing his defensive skills because he's never going to amount to anything. The Wonder Kid blasting training schedules for attacking players, for midfielders, and for defenders are all linked down in the description. They're very similar to the U18s training that we looked at before, but they emphasize training one specific unit, one specific skill set. You can rotate these into your normal training if you have a couple of other kids you want to make sure you're working on, but you have a lot of good young strikers you want to make sure develop. And the end goal is to get them to at least first team level by the time they turn 18 so they can get first team matches with you and you don't have to worry about loans. If you do have to worry about loans, it's probably a better option than wherever your reserve or B team or U23's team is playing. Factors you need to consider are the reputation of the club, the facilities of the club, the guaranteed playing time. Of course, there might be financial factors and how much of their wage is being paid. There will be rules factors in your you know, league, your nation, how many players you can loan out domestically and abroad. You can set a lot of this stuff in staff responsibilities, transfers and contracts and offers to club. You can set the level of the facilities, the nation, or even the league that the team is playing in so you can loan domestically. So you can make sure that homegrown and adaptability are not issues when it comes to your loan. If the player has good adaptability or is already homegrown or it doesn't matter, you don't have to worry about that stuff. Then there are two other pieces to training. There are player traits, of course. Player traits players that do specific things well. I have a player, uh, where is Vanderhorst? Owen Vanderhorst, who's got a lot of player traits. He plays killer balls, one, twos, switches the ball to wide areas and gets forward whenever possible. You can always hover over a player trait to inform you about what that player trait does. And I made a whole video about player traits here. Just know that that and training weaker foot, which is the other part of training and adding an additional focus to any set of attributes you might want to train, adds intensity to the training at the bottom. You don't want to go over medium and it dilutes the focus of the training entirely because the player is doing more they can spend less time on each particular thing so they're going to spend less time getting better if they're working on a player trait and player traits add to their current ability which means they eat into their potential ability so only add them if they are very important to making sure the player is playing well which you'll know from that video i really hope this is the right shoulder too i have no idea what shoulder it's over it could be up here it's a link weaker foot training does the same thing it dilutes training but it will get that weak foot up to balanced eventually or <clears throat> not balanced what is it it'll get that weak foot up to reasonable eventually which is rock solid that is every aspect of training so what are the basic tenets the commandments of training no matter what you do to your training the intensity should peak 
two days after a match and then scale down roughly into the next match day. If you have more than one match in a week, then you probably don't want to peak right before the next match because that doesn't allow a lot of time to scale down. Physicals move the fastest. Mentals move the slowest in development. And technicals are in the middle. Everything you add to a player's training distracts from other things. The only thing that you want to add universally on every player is that they train a specific position, not just playing position. You want them actually training a specific position, even if it is the position that they already play. This quite honestly just allows them to train more. You will see an immediate improvement for the development of all your players that do this. Only have players in your first team that actually play. If they don't actually play and then play youth matches instead, they're missing out on more than a month's worth of training every year. And the final tenant, have a starter and a backup at each position. Pass that, either have players on loan in your youth team so they can get more training or something else. The last few spots in your squad should be taken up by old guys, specifically for mentoring. If you go to training and mentoring, you create a group with somebody who is old and has a good personality and good media handling style. The ideal group size for mentors, four to five. And this is something that I don't utilize well in my save either. You want a defender, a midfielder, and an attacker, and you want them mentoring players that have worse personalities and worse media handling styles so that they may improve faster. This is the only time that you should allow a very talented, high potential young player join the first team if they're not gonna play regularly because this will allow them to be mentored if they have a terrible personality or media handling style. If you wanna watch a video on player personalities to know what's good or not for mentoring, we have that video for you right here. And that includes a complete guide to training and football manager. If you have any questions, concerns, thoughts, improvements, hit the comments, join the Discord and share your thoughts. And if not, then you just did a lot of heavy lifting mentally. Why not sit back and relax and watch me simulate the 2022 World Cup? It was a very good time. We simulated qualifying too and Curacao made it, so.